<sighs> I was bored in school. Lots of us were. And when kids are bored and restless, schools usually blame the kid. One in five high school boys diagnosed with ADHD. Millions are given drugs to try to make them sit still. I was the, the rowdy kid. That was the bad kid. And so they really, really pressured my parents to actually put me on ADHD medication. Adderall. Yeah, Adderall, Ritalin. It was like I, I had been lobotomized. And my, my parents said, this is not our son. They then sent him to other schools. He hated them all. I would come home, I would sometimes just cry. What better things could I have been doing during that time where I was just sitting in a classroom having information chucked at me? So what did you do? I left. He left because he heard about a school that teaches in a different way. Like, okay, so how do we actually increase our knowledge? The school is the academy of thought and industry. No I, I way. Found it to be there. I found it. But the school costs money. I got a job at a coffee shop. To work here, he got up at 3 in the morning. By 3.30, he was in the shop, setting up tables and chairs, cleaning the counters. I would get the bacon frying, get already, all, the, all the breakfast items ready. Hard work just to go to this school. Academy of Thought and Industry, it sounds Soviet. I want my students to think with their minds and understand the world, and I want them to get stuff done. Michael Strong started the academy, telling parents kids learn better by doing actual work. Teens need responsibility. Ben Franklin, Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison started their careers at the age of 12 or 13. Yeah, that was abusive child labor. I worked as a teen. I loved it. At his schools, there are now two with more on the way. Students get Fridays off to work on their own projects. There are no lectures. Instead, students read and discuss things. Because there's still people and people still have certain drives. That's very different from schools strong attended and hated. School is 13 years of how to be passive and how, be, how to be dependent. The Republican-controlled House of Representatives... Sit still, read, listen to your elders, repeat. Anyone know the effects? School is about aim, 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 and never get stuff done. So I want students who, let's just go out there, get stuff done, fail, get up, try again. That's how we become creators, entrepreneurs. We want them to do what they love now. Cade was given projects like start a business today. Why was that more interesting than studying history or doing a science project? Because the money, because the money. Uh, I'm currently working on making a web-based chat application. Students study what they care about. I want to be a programmer. Uh, I love programming. We got to create a project and immediately start, you know, feeling the rewards of it. I was doing a few sketches for like the costume designs. I actually work at a paintball place. If they love paintball, then they should do a business in that. Dorian Domi started a music business. At this point in my career, I booked almost 200 bands. His music festival brings in tens of thousands of dollars. We have students who have done websites for American Idol finalists. These people used the website then as their own? For about nine months and then he fired the team and a high school team and got a better team. That was a great experience for my students. Uh, to get fired by a client is actually a really good experience. You do that several times and that's how you get better at getting stuff done. So companies hire strong students. Cade got a marketing job right out of high school. At a place called Launchpeer, which I currently am at today. People say you got to go to college. Um, well, look at me. <laughs> Most of strong students do go to college. We've had students be admitted to top liberal arts colleges, Bard, Bennington. Of course they do well. You're charging fat tuition. Only rich kids can afford to go there, and they're going to do well. The t kind of kids that we get come from all walks of life. We had a student from New Jersey. He was incapable of functioning in the highly structured public school system. In middle school, elementary school, I was you know, incredibly socially isolated. In the public schools, he needed a full-time aid. He was costing the state an enormous amount of money. He came to our school. He did not need an aid. Coming here is just healing. It's incredible. So much so that some students wake up at 3 in the morning to go to work to help pay tuition. It was me choosing my life. Venezuela. 
No one wants to take responsibility for it. We've heard time and time again that it's not fair to judge socialism based on the performance of Venezuela's economy, or the economy of any other socialist state, for that matter. And whenever a socialist state fails, the argument is inevitably made that this was because they either weren't really socialist, or fell due to factors outside of their socialism. And while no nation in the real world can perfectly match a theoretical ideal, Venezuela is about as close to socialism as a country can get. In fact, Venezuela's government either meets or comes very close to meeting each of the ten tenets of a socialist government that Marx lays out himself in the Communist Manifesto. So, with Venezuela is clearly a socialist state, how can Marx's practices not be in any part to blame for its collapse? One of the main arguments cited by apologists is that Venezuela isn't collapsing due to socialism, rather its dependence on oil in lieu of serious losses in the average cost per barrel. It's true that the cost of oil has dropped immensely, but how much of the failure of the state of Venezuela can be attributed to this? Well, not only is Venezuela not the largest exporter of oil, it isn't even the most oil-dependent nation. It ranks in eighth place for that. Yet according to the IMF, of the 15 largest oil exporting countries, Venezuela's economy has tanked more dramatically and persistently than any other. In fact, it's the only country in the group which was in recession through 2014, 2015, and 2016. For years, Venezuela's economy seemed to be doing okay. But this was illusory. See, when an economy grows, that can be because they're making more good stuff, or it can be because the stuff they already have is increasing in value. The latter was the case in Venezuela. Under socialism, there wasn't as much incentive for individuals to invest in harvesting more oil, or for workers to be more productive. This was seen in other areas of the economy as well. Steel production, for example, fell by more than 70% after it was nationalized in 2008. So their oil supply stayed at about the same level, even shrinking a bit. And this was masked by the fact that the price of oil was increasing. But unfortunately, prices didn't increase forever. Thing is, even when oil prices were at an all-time high, the Venezuelan government lacked funds. But like a good socialist state, they refused to stop spending. So they monetized their debts, flooding the economy with extra cash and creating a crisis of hyperinflation. As a result, people are now starving in the streets, struggling to have their most basic needs met and suffering in other ways most of us living in developed and free nations may never understand. These kinds of mishaps are the inevitable result of central planning. A market economy isn't perfect, but it allows for people who are good with specific resources to accumulate and manage large supplies of them, whether it be oil, steel, food, or any other important resource. Under socialism, management of precious resources is left up to whomever happens to be empowered by a whimsical and politically operating state to oversee production, and mismanagement almost always ensues. The resulting chaos eliminates countless human lives and creates more unnecessary human suffering than can be quantified. When bearing witness to this kind of injustice, don't allow proponents of the theories which led to it to fall back on the cop-out that it wasn't real socialism. This is cold comfort to the millions who were promised a Marxist utopia just a few years ago and are now eating family pets just to stay alive. And it'll be cold comfort to you if you let them destroy your country. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching. If you find this content valuable and would like to help the people who worked on it to get paid, please donate at subscribestar.com slash freedomtunes or to donate using PayPal at freedomtunes.tv slash hashtag slash donate. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Echo Chamber. I'm your host, Dr. Mack. In today's news, stats show that this past year in the U.S., guns have killed nearly 15,000 people, whereas people have killed approximately zero guns. The longer we go without punishing the firearms responsible for these crimes, the more innocent human lives will be ended as a result of this disturbing trend of gun-on-human violence. So how many guns were held responsible in 2017? According to the Justice Department and FBI statistics, not a single firearm has served any jail time. Meanwhile, virtually every individual to be arrested for a gun crime has been a human. That's right, not only are guns killing people, but people are getting arrested for it. Here to debate, we have a gun. How do you answer to the accusations leveled against you? 
Oh, that's ridiculous. Everyone knows the good guy with a gun is a myth. Well, the fact is, I... Uh, stop. Please, please stop interrupting me. I gave you your chance to... I gave you your chance to speak. The fact is, guns are used to commit crimes far more often than they're used to prevent them. I read it on Vox. There are nearly 15,000 gun homicides per year and 30,000 total gun deaths. Do you even know how many times per year guns are used defensively? 2.5 million times... Oh, please, only brainwashed NRA lobbyists who hate children believe that figure. Where did you even get that stat? The, the CDC? You mean the CDC? Oh, man. All right, well, never let facts get in the way before. Well, I suppose that would mean that guns are used to prevent crime far, far more often than they're used to commit them, but the NRA, uh, they have too much power. Yeah. They're buying our democracy and using their power to spread pro-gun nonsense. We have to get dirty money out of politics. What do you mean it would take the NRA 30 years to spend as much on lobbying as Planned Parenthood spends annually? I, I don't see how that's relevant. I mean, besides, in other countries where the NRA isn't relevant, there's virtually no gun crime. What? Australia's gun ban had zero effect on gun crime as it was falling at an identical rate before the buyback? And there are more guns in Australia now than there were then? Well, what about England? Okay, maybe England's gun crime did spike after the ban and took 10 years to decrease to normal levels, and maybe there is no evidence that gun bans have resulted in decreased crime or whatever, but why won't you NRA bigots just make a few compromises? I don't get it. Uh, fair enough. I, I mean, they would get literally nothing in return, so compromise is the wrong term, and I'm actually just asking for a warrantless concession on aspects of the rights of an entire constitutional republic, but there's reasons that, uh, it, uh, um, the, uh, why did you make me do this gun? Ah, uh, look, ah! I normally don't do this being an inanimate object and all but I just want to come to life for a brief moment in order to argue against my own moral agency or any notion that I could be held responsible for anything as I am a non-sentient being. What is this, a Bernie rally? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks to We The Internet's Lou Perez for lending his voice to this video. If you enjoyed this cartoon and would like to continue to be supplied with your weekly dose of Freedom Tunes, please donate at freedomtunes.tv slash hashtag slash donate or make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash freedomtunes. There are nearly 300,000 people at the March for Life this year, so it shouldn't be too hard for us to find at least one psycho to malign the entire movement. Hey, look at that. Ah, perfect. We are going to destroy these guys. Whoever made these signs is about to have their life ruined. Get away from my signs, honky. What? Who are you guys? Where are the white supremacists? We are the black Israelites. We are here to protest the white fascists. White people need to go back to Portland. Well, I mean... We wouldn't want to ruin their lives over this one mistake. Gays are inferior! Yeah, you know, and this really doesn't seem like much of a story. Why hurt the reputation of these innocent men? Pocahontas was a black man! Amen, brother! And I mean, we wouldn't want to blow anything out of proportion and- Hey! Is that white kid smirking?! Get his ducks! You saw it here. That kid is a white supremacist. This is where he goes to school. Let him know how you feel about it. Next in the news, how Trump's reckless comments make life unsafe for media pundits. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see Freedom Tunes continue to be able to whip up these topical animations, please donate at freedomtunes.tv slash hashtag slash donate or at paypal.me slash freedomtunes for a one-time donation. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Echo Chamber. I'm your host, Dr. Mac. In today's episode, we're going to be taking an in-depth look into the alt-right. What is the alt-right? 
we'll be asking our expert, someone who isn't alt-right and has never spoken to an alt-right person in their life. Julie? Hello, Mac. How are you? I'm doing alt-right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that one sucked. So, Jules, what is the alt-right? Honestly, I have no clue. Oh. But what I do know, Mac, is you can call anyone you disagree with alt-right, and then you'll no longer have to confront their arguments. Interesting. But can't we already do that with labels like racist or Nazi? Oh, yes, but those words have in many ways lost their meanings. And because they're thrown around so much, people are skeptical of the accusations. Whereas the label alt-right is great because some people actually do identify with it. And so the accusations are equally frightening but more plausible. But is it insinuating that someone holds a set of political values which they truly reject libelous? Max, Socrates once said that before you say anything, you must ask yourself, is it true, is it kind, and is it useful? Because if it is useful, you can ignore whether or not it's true or kind. So, what kind of evidence do you need before calling someone alt-right? Literally none. The trick is to take for granted that they're alt-right and assume everyone else will, too. You'll notice that in many articles published by left-wing media outlets, they won't make the case that someone is alt-right. They'll just call them alt-right or associate them with the alt-right in the headline and go on to talk about other issues they have with them in the article. And if you call them out, you just get labeled a fanboy. It's great! Fascinating! Well, this alt-right label does appear to be a useful linguistic tool. Speaking of linguistic tools, Dave Rubin, is he alt-right? Would it be useful to call him alt-right? I suppose so. Then yes. What about Jordan Peterson? Well, if you could dismiss him as alt-right, it sure would be easier to refute his arguments. Wow, another conservative pundit proven to be alt-right. Ben Shapiro? Oh, it's extremely useful to call him outright, yes. Placing them in the exact same category as someone like Richard Spencer. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you. So, then wait. What happens when we have to make the distinction between actual regular conservatives and centrists and the alt-right? Won't it become increasingly difficult? And won't that empower the alt-right to further infiltrate the mainstream and spread their values? Well, as Socrates and many other famous philosophers also implied... Thinking ahead is for losers, so I didn't do it. Never do. Thanks for stopping by, folks. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. We're trying to get back on track after the Patreon drama, and we finally have a new donation portal set up at freedomtunes.tv. Click the donate button or go to freedomtunes.tv slash hashtag slash donate if you would like to help us make more cartoons. Thank you so much. What? Patreon banned Sargon? And I lost over a hundred patrons because of it? Oh, this is insane. If this keeps up, I don't know how I'm going to be able to afford to keep cranking out content. And what if I'm next? And what about Sargon? I mean, what is he going to do? Um, if you don't like Patreon violating its own terms of service, find a new platform! Oh yeah, good idea. Nice! I gained all my patrons back through Subscribestar. What? Who told you you could find a new platform? Hello? PayPal? Yes, this is PayPal. What's your emergency? Subscribestar funds bigots! Bigots? Yes! Stop processing their payments! Right away, boss. <sighs> Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this content, please donate at the link in the description. We need you now more than ever. I love y'all, and I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Patriarchy oppressing me, I'm at a university. A student in gender studies learning about misogyny. Patriarchy is a thing to and I'm a man, but don't assume. My gender is all up to me, why are you invalidating? My life experiences, I hate myself cause I exist. I am a privileged white male and my skin is male, so I am oppressing you. I am very, very, very privileged. I am very, very, very privileged.
this is a safe space You are not allowed, you don't behave You upset the minorities You support white supremacy I know because I'm very woke I knew the first time that you spoke Patriarchy was on your lips Pushing outdated narratives Thinking about only yourself Threatening students' mental health Don't you know we're all victims of some sort of bad Spend all my time on Tumblr But I know what it's like to be poor I've never had a job before Why do I need one anyway? Why can't I stay home and get paid? Capitalism exploits me That's what my professor told me I know it's true, he makes money That's why he took the class for free Boy, this only took skin money Taxpayers, but that's free to me You cannot earn economic privilege Meritocracy is non-existent I know you use dark whistle terms I've cracked your code, so I have learned To read your mind, that's why I may Accuse you of thoughts you didn't say Oppressors and the oppressed My worldview is not complex Conspiracies of hierarchies Oppress all the minorities All other analyses Simply a whole hierarchy Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please donate at subscribestar.com slash freedomtunes or at patreon.com slash freedomtunes. This video took a lot of hard work from some very talented people and it was more expensive to produce than our usual content. And we lost money due to people leaving Patreon over Patreon's policies. So we need your donations now more than ever if you would like to see us continue to upload quality content on a weekly basis. Thank you so much for your viewership and Merry Christmas. So, what's with the Ark? It's not an Ark! It's a vessel! This isn't a religious thing! Why does it say Ark on it? It doesn't! It says A-R-K! Authoritarian Resistance Carrier! You know the Noah's Ark narrative exists in Islam too, right? Oh yeah, it's an Ark then. I built an Ark. Oh. Why? Didn't you hear? We're going to pass the point of no return for global warming soon! And according to Al Gore, this whole place should be underwater by now! Huh. You know you can be concerned about the potential for climate change without... being an insane alarmist about it, right? You're just gonna wait for the floods to happen without an ark and you're calling me insane?! Uh... Why so many elephants? Ugh! Don't you know the story? I need one of each gender! It's 2018. There's gonna be drag kids in the world. And I'm one of them. So here we are, with child drag queens being paraded around as the new normal, the new healthy. The new way for your son to express his individuality. Because after all, it is 2019. The current year, in fact. And this is the level we have sunk to. Well, actually that clip was clearly filmed in 2018, which was last year. So I'm guessing, as this is 2019, we are going to sink even lower. As that's the thing with progressive politics. It just keeps on progressing. But where is it progressing to? Where is this all going to end? Well, I can answer that for you. It ends when the final taboo is broken. When every single moral boundary is breached. When every single barrier of decency has been smashed. 
And some people will be quick to chime in that this is all about attacking masculinity. It's all about making little boys into little girls. It's about emasculating future generations of men. And sure, to a degree it is. That's definitely part of what is going on here. Promoting child drag queens certainly helps push that agenda. And that agenda is definitely being pushed more and more. But I think the emasculation of young boys is actually the smaller part of this. The big part of this is actually the normalization of paedophilia. The real drive behind this part of the progressive agenda is the sexualization of children and the normalization of viewing children as sexual objects and by extension, this all normalizes the practice of placing children within completely inappropriate and sexualized environments. And I called this, I stated some time ago that this was where the so-called sexual revolution was leading. Over two years ago, I released a video called The LGBT Agenda is Helping to Normalize Paedophilia. It's linked in the description below. In that video, I presented a large amount of evidence showing how the same people who pushed for LGBT acceptance were now pushing for much worse. And I cited articles from mainstream news sources that attempted to normalize incest, bestiality, and yes, even paedophilia. And the way these articles tried to normalize these sexual perversions was through humanizing the people who participated in them. And we will come back to that theme later. But since that video was uploaded, we have seen the rise of what has been termed child drag queens. Little boys who are paraded around, dressed in drag, sexualized, and then leered at by grown men. And when we say little boys, we are not talking about boys who have reached puberty. We are not talking about mature boys. We are talking about little boys. Boys aged 10 or 11, and sometimes even younger. And this horrific trend reached a new low at the end of last year, when one of these child drag queens danced at an adult homosexual venue in New York as grown men threw money at him as if he was a stripper. I read this from LifeSight, and I quote, New York, New York, December the 17th, 2018. Perhaps sensing the horrific optics of the event, LGBT news sites have assiduously avoided reporting that their favorite 11-year-old drag kid, Desmond is Amazing, danced on stage in a New York gay bar while adult male patrons tossed money his way as if he were a male stripper. The pre-adolescent boy, dressed in drag to imitate singer Gwen Stefani, pranced around the stage at Brooklyn's $3 bill, an LGBT bar described as queer-owned and operated, and Brooklyn's premier queer bar and performance venue. End quote. So let's break this down. We have an adult homosexual venue that had a child drag queen perform on stage as adult homosexual men threw money at him. And this is tolerated and no doubt even applauded by many liberal and progressive thinkers and policymakers. But don't fool yourself into thinking this is an isolated incident. Oh no, this is part of a concentrated effort to normalize this kind of behavior and paint this kind of activity as both healthy and normal, all under the guise of acceptance and tolerance and letting people express themselves. I read this from The Blaze, and I quote, Nemis Quinn Melanson Golden, 10, aka Queen Lactatia, appears in a Hook magazine feature that glorifies the child's drag queen lifestyle. A photo shoot for the magazine included an unpublished photo of Nemis with the nude winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, Violet Charchi, who is wearing nothing but high heels and a tiny patch of black fabric across the genital area. The photo appeared on Twitter. In it, Nemesis is leaning in toward Violet with a wow expression on his face. 
According to credits, Jonathan Turton photographed the spread, which includes Nemis sitting with his legs open in an evening-style black dress, a bright purple wig and fishnet stockings, end quote. A ten-year-old boy dressed in women's clothes posing with a naked man who is pretending to be a woman. What's your problem with that, bigot? Don't you know? It's the current year. But we all know what liberals and progressives will say. These are just isolated cases. This is fringe behavior. It's not like it's mainstream. Please welcome Desmond Naples, AKA Desmond is amazing. <laughs> that clip was taken from Good Morning America, a daily show on a major US network that has a viewership of roughly four and a half million people. If that's not an example of this being pushed by the mainstream, I don't know what is. And the boy featured in that clip, the same one featured in the clip at the beginning of this video, is known as Desmond is Amazing. He is 11. He shot to prominence in 2017 when images of him performing at gay pride events went viral. But he was active on the gay pride scene much earlier and appeared in a music video for the song The Bacon Shake, performed by a drag queen called Jinx Monsoon when he was aged just seven. And that in itself is quite strange if you ask me. Why would a seven-year-old have such awareness of sexual ideas and themes? Unless someone has attempted to indoctrinate that child. But reading from his Wikipedia page may give you a clue about this. And I quote, Desmond identifies as gay and states that he has been out since a very early age. Desmond's parents stated that at the age of two or three, they understood that he was likely gay and they exposed him to a variety of gay culture, including showing him drag performances and taking him to pride parades. Desmond's parents stated that he was openly gay when he entered kindergarten. Desmond's mother reports that he began gravitating towards drag performances when he was two and watched RuPaul's Drag Race. End quote. Sounds like indoctrination to me. I mean, homosexuality is a sexual orientation. It refers to the gender that a person has a romantic or sexual attraction to. Why would a child be even thinking about sexual themes and ideas? And let's get this straight. Desmond's parents claim that he was openly gay before he entered kindergarten, which for the record starts at five years of age in the US. But indoctrinating children and pushing sexual material upon them is sadly nothing new, as similar material and themes are already being pushed in schools and libraries. Remember Drag Queen Story Hour, where toddlers had progressive stories read to them by drag queens in public libraries? Now again, I could go into this in much more depth. However, I already made an entire video on this very topic. It's called Drag Queens Invited into British Primary Schools. Again, it's linked in the description below. But this sickening trend of sexualizing children and normalizing behavior that is clearly highly inappropriate is nothing new. And it certainly isn't a series of isolated cases or fringe behavior. The liberal political establishment and the mainstream media are committed to pushing this agenda and are doing so at an alarming pace. And the only logical conclusion that one can draw is that this push is an attempt to break the final taboo, that the people promoting this are attempting to normalize the sexualization of children and ultimately attempting to normalize paedophilia. 
And the people doing this are the same ones that pushed for every other form of sexual taboo to be taken out of the closet and paraded publicly as both normal and healthy, whilst at the same time admonishing anyone that attempted to push back against this trend as intolerant, a hater and a bigot. And you've heard their arguments before. Calm down, bigot. This isn't about you. This is about letting people love. It's about tolerating other people's choices, letting people express themselves. It's not like they will be coming into schools and forcing it upon your children. Well, that's exactly what they have done, because your children are their target. And all this has been done through careful and calculated emotional manipulation. Every form of sickness and degeneracy that has been normalised has been done so by making the public feel sympathy for those that the media have held up as the poster boys for whatever they are currently trying to normalise. And they have even tried to do this with actual paedophiles. Two mainstream news outlets, Salon and Vice, attempted to do this with a self-confessed paedophile named Todd Nickerson. Salon has since removed that article, however, it's still available on archive sites. The Vice article, titled, A Paedophile Opens Up About Being Targeted by Vigilantes, is however, still live. This article talks about the stigma attached to being a paedophile. It then goes on to attempt to make the reader feel sorry for the paedophile in question, before finally asserting that stigmatising paedophiles can in fact endanger children. So you can effectively see that the mainstream media and the liberal establishment are actually pushing a two-pronged attack here. Not only have they normalised every single kind of perversion, even attempting to make the public feel sympathy for paedophiles, but they are also trying to sexualise children and are actually preparing children to be targeted by sexual predators by placing them in wholly inappropriate situations and environments. Because remember, if liberals can tell you that your child can consent to a sex change, that your child can consent to choosing their sexual orientation before they enter kindergarten, what else will liberals say that your child can consent to? Why not ask these people exactly what their sacred chant of love is love actually encompasses? Because none of this has happened by accident. This is a concerted effort by the mainstream media and the liberal establishment that is aimed at undermining our society and destroying our civilization by completely smashing our moral compass. Our enemies have not only made us tolerate degeneracy and perversion, but they have held up degeneracy and perversion as virtues, as traits that should be aspired to and seen as not just healthy and normal, but in fact as ideals that should be placed on a pedestal and worshipped. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help spread the message by liking and sharing it on social networks. If you want to hear more from me, please hit the subscribe button, as new videos are posted every week. You can also read my book, The Fall of Western Man. It's available as a free ebook and in both hardback and paperback, and all the links are in the description below. Finally, if you want to join in the discussion with me, feel free to add me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Also, you can now follow me on Gab, Mines, and BitChute as well. Everyone's welcome. 80% of Vatican priests are gay and living in the closet, according to an explosive new book, to be published next week. The 570-page expose, titled In the Closet of the Vatican, claims that four in five clerics in the Roman Catholic Church are homosexuals, but aren't necessarily sexually active. French sociologist and journalist Frédéric Martel, who spent four years conducting 1,500 interviews for the book, found that some priests maintain discreet long-term relationships, while others live double lives having casual sex with gay partners and using male prostitutes.
he found that a number of clerics spoke of an unspoken code of the closet, with one rule of thumb being that the more homophobic they were, the more likely they were gay. The author, a former advisor to the French government, claims the late Alfonso López Trujillo, a Colombian cardinal who held senior roles in the Vatican, was an arch defender of the Church's teaching on homosexuality and contraception while using male prostitutes, according to Catholic website The Tablet. The book is a startling account of corruption and hypocrisy at the heart of the Vatican, according to British publisher Bloomsbury. In its marketing material, Bloomsbury claims the book reveals secrets about celibacy, misogyny and plots against Pope Francis. But critics of the book said it is not always easy to tell when Martel is trafficking in fact, rumor, eyewitness accounts are hearsay, according to the tablet. It's due to be released in eight languages across 20 countries next Wednesday, on the day that Pope Francis holds a summit at the Vatican on sexual abuse attended by bishops from all over the world. Martel, a former advisor to the French government who is openly gay, claims he spoke with 41 cardinals, 52 bishops and monsignors, 45 papal ambassadors or diplomatic officials, 11 Swiss guards and more than 200 priests and seminarians as research for the book. The author spent around 200 weeks staying in residences inside the Vatican in Rome, according to the tablet. Although the book doesn't conflate homosexuality with the child sex abuse in the church, Martel claims gay priests do not want to report abuse on children in case their own homosexuality is exposed according to sources familiar with the book's contents, 